I'd like to talk a little bit about relational power. Relational power is something that we all experience and know about on a very personal level. For example, uh, I do things for my wife and she does things for me and we have a love relationship and because of that love relationship I can sometimes even ask for a back rub and she won't begrudgingly give it. She'll be happy to do it. Now if I never invested in that relationship, if I never gave anything to her, if I didn't love her, well then she might not be willing to give a back rub. And I can't just ask any old woman to give me a back rub, or I better not. In other words, it's, um, I don't have relational power. I don't have a draw. I don't have a calling card. I don't have, I don't have what it takes relationally to tap into such a thing. God has ordained that we live in a web of interdependencies with other people, other beings even, even to the angels, God himself, the Trinity. We're part of a vast network and it's supposed to be run according to the royal law, which is love. When there is love, we can tap into the common wealth of vast numbers of people. I wouldn't say that it gives us an entitlement, but it tends to look that way almost. Because if you, the more people you invest in, the more favor you receive from them collectively over time. And the more, if you have a need, the more you can tap into the this network but a selfish person who never invests in other people, thinks only of themselves, <coughs> they are, they, they don't have such a network. They are really poor. They don't have much relational power. This is the nature of love. Love gives another person the ability to influence yourself. In other words, if I love you, I open up my heart to you, and I also open up my life to you. I even open up my pocketbook, my time, my everything. It's, to some extent, it's, it's, it works that way. Love opens you, as it were, to give. Love in your heart. And relationships that are loving relationships then are loves where, are, where you don't hold back, where you give freely. Well, God invites us into this circle, this network of interrelational power. The Father cares for the Son, the Son cares for the Holy Spirit. They care for each other. They all It's a circle of love in the Trinity, giving and receiving at all times. And that's what He wants to model to us here on earth among us humans that are so broken, so separated, so alienated from him and each other. He wishes to bring us into this circle of love, as it were. Well, how does this relate to prayer? Well, let, let me illustrate by a story that's found in Genesis. God comes down to visit Abraham and God has this aside with himself, and maybe it's the rest of the Trinity, maybe it talks about angels, but then it talks about it being the Lord. So it's a bit of a mystery, but he visits Abraham and he says to himself or to his other, the other angels or beings that accompany him, should I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Since through him all the earth will be blessed and he will be the one that will teach his children after him to follow the Lord, etc., etc., etc. I'm paraphrasing. But basically, God brings us into his private conversations, as it were, and says, No, I am going to bring 
Abraham because of his relationship with me and because of his future with me I'm going to bring him into this network and I'm going to disclose to him what I'm about to do I'm allow him to have the relational power he's going to be a partner with me somehow or another in this so essentially what he said is that Abraham I'm about ready to go visit Sodom and Gomorrah and destroy it and it doesn't say the scripture doesn't say what God's expectation of what Abraham's reaction is but Abraham did have a nephew there and, uh, and Abraham had nieces there and God says I'm going to destroy it well I think this is my opinion but I think it, God was setting Abraham up to see what Abraham would do and because he gave Abraham relational power Abraham pleaded with God he negotiated with the all-powerful God God Almighty he started at 50 if there's 50 righteous will you spare the city because of 50 okay if there's and I don't know remember how he went down but he went down from 50 all the way down to five God said okay then even if there's five I'll spare the city well there wasn't five actually and God didn't spare the city but he did end up sparing Lot so what's this about God gave and invited Abraham to pray that's really what it, the bottom line God invited Abraham into having a place of determining the destiny of people God invited Abraham to, as it were, become a partner with him in, I guess you could say, being God in a way. Because God supposedly has power, right? He chooses to have power. He chooses to use that power to bless and to curse, to bring to fruition the affairs of men, to... He is on the throne. He makes decisions that affect us all. But the amazing thing about prayer is that because of our relationship with Him and because of His heart toward us, because He's created us to be sons and to rule and to reign with Him, because we have His dominion DNA in us, because He's told us, to have dominion over the earth and we will even over angels in the future because of this he wants us to pray he wants us to ask he wants us to have relational power with him to change the affairs of the world to change the future even wow this is our God this is grace upon grace, and it's too much for most men and women, even Christian women, to take fully into their hearts.